All right, let me have you open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, and I'm going to try to move a little quicker because there are a few texts I want you to turn to with me as we go, but Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, here the Lord Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, the night before his crucifixion, and he's had his last supper with the apostles. Judas Iscariot has left the group and has gone to inform the priests and the officials where they will be able to find Jesus that night to apprehend him. Um, he's taken the other 11 into the garden to pray, and he's separated himself a little bit from them to go and pray alone. And he knows in just a little while Judas is going to come with a band of officers to arrest him. And this is the setting of Christ praying the night before he was crucified for our sake. Look at verses 41 and 42. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I'm going to focus on one word as we get started today, and that is the word nevertheless. The word nevertheless is like the words still, um, however, yet, I've been doing this, however, I can do that. Um, I'm not the most handsome man, nevertheless, <laughs> I'm all you've got, baby. <laughs> but nevertheless is a, a pivotal uh, word. It, it connects two ideas together. And in this opening example, the physical human body of the Lord Jesus Christ was not looking forward to being arrested, to be deprived of sleep that night, to then be uh, tried in a, a mock uh, trial before an angry crowd of religious scribes and authorities to be uh, scourged and beaten and then uh, be forced to carry a heavy cross to Mount Calvary and then have his hands and feet nailed under that cross and stripped naked and held up to a death of public shame and ridicule. Who would look forward to that? But he prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. How many Christians talk to God like that? How many Christians think of the Lord that way? I want my life to do certain things. I want it to go in a certain direction. I enjoy doing some things with my pastimes and having a certain bit of uh, fun and entertainment. Nevertheless, God, whatever you want me to do is more important. How many Christians talk to God like, how many Christians think of God like that? Fewer and fewer. Fewer and fewer. But I want to take you to three different texts this morning that use that term and see if we can draw some lessons out of each of them. So go, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And notice there verse 11. Hebrews 12, verse 11. Paul writes, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. That's got to be one of the most eloquent and graceful verses in the entire Bible. Its vocabulary is impeccable. It's beautiful. And the theme of that verse is how much benefit a good spanking can do you once in a while. We don't think of it when we're reading. It just sounds like beautiful poetry. But he's talking about a dad whipping that kid's backside to get, so the kid gets the point, gets the message. 
No child, it says, no, no chasing for the present seemeth to be joyous. No child likes discipline. No child likes being spanked. But uh, you roll up a newspaper and smack your dog when that dog makes a mess on the carpet, right? Well, kids aren't much smarter. And the only way to, to uh, effectively enforce the lesson is by a little physical uh, <laughs> treatment. Let me put it that way. To reinforce what you want them to know. To uh, discourage the bad behavior and encourage the good behavior. To keep them from doing the bad thing or the wrong thing in the future. Verse 6 states, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. To chasten is to punish with the intent of correcting bad behavior. To teach a lesson, to teach them how they ought to behave, and to discourage the way they were behaving. To scourge is to punish because somebody needs to be punished. Any corrective benefit that comes later, that's secondary. Some things need to be punished. They, you, they can't be left unpunished. Life is too short to play the little timeout game with your kids. Spank them, then give them time out. In the best of both worlds. <laughs> but the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. A child can be chastened rather easily, a loud word, or depriving them of some fun thing they were hoping to, to do. But when you grow up, the Lord might need to use uh, more severe methods to get your attention, to get you to stop doing what you've been doing, to give up something that you need to give up. So you can represent him well. I don't want to go through life and be an embarrassment to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think about, about the great Christians in history, people we owe a great debt to for their sacrifice and their faithfulness, the ones that preserved and translated the scriptures so that we have them in our hands today, and things that they went through, suffering, imprisonment, and persecution, and scourging, and whipping, and uh, any number of things because of their faith and their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. They weren't going to deny Christ. And we look back on them with great fondness. We think of them as our heroes in the Christian faith. They weren't perfect. They weren't flawless, men and women. But we think of their faithfulness. And uh, they lived lives that were exemplary. And they weren't a disgrace to Jesus Christ. In the end, when all is said and done, they had a good reputation that you and I, generations later, can look back on and say, I want to be like them. But Romans 12, verse 2, says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I've called this the nevertheless of transformation. It's amazing how the power of the gospel and the grace of Jesus Christ can change somebody. Go from a rotten sinner to a wonderful saint by the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6 reminds us, we have the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean you know everything God knows, but it means you see the work of God the way Christ sees it. You understand the scriptures and learn to understand the scriptures uh, as Christ would understand them. But the rebellious Christian isn't trying to live that way for God. And God has to chasten them from time to time. Hebrews 12 and verse 10 tells us why the Lord has to chasten us. Quote, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. One of the most Probably the most outstanding characteristic of the God of the Bible is that he is holy. He's absolutely sinless. He's pure. He's spotless. He's undefiled. He's separate from his creation. He's separate from create, uh, sinners like you and me. And only by his kindness and his grace, willing to forgive and save you, uh, did you ever have any chance to have fellowship with him once again? 
but he's completely pure and holy without any stain of wickedness. Some Christians never learn how to pray until they're in a hospital, they've got nowhere to turn, and they're crying out to God in desperation. Some Christians never give up some unclean, um, unhealthy habit until some medical uh, report tells them they have to give it up or die. Some people never go back to church and be with the brethren. They thought they could be an independent Christian, like an independent contractor. I don't need to go to church. I can live for God on my own, my own. until their money's gone. They don't have any more friends. They don't know where to turn. And they realize maybe I ought to go back and give those Christians another chance. <laughs> See, you go through hard times. And God's trying to get your attention. The wise man, the wise woman, he sees or they see the circumstances they're in the problems they're having, and instead of getting mad at God, they should ask, how can this bring me closer to God? Can I get closer to God with this problem? That's how you look at it. The kind, that kind of change in your heart, that kind of change in your mind and your thinking is just the kind of transformation God intends when he saves you. He doesn't want you living only for yourself and to satisfy your own lusts and wants. Nevertheless, Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The closer you get to Jesus Christ, the farther you get from the corruption and the pollution of the world. The farther you want, you want to get. The, 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 the less familiar you want to be with the temptations and the things of the world. The closer you get to Jesus Christ. Paul said that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If suffering, if sickness is some trouble, is the thing that is necessary to bring you closer to God, to trust him like you never trusted him before, then so be it. And so be it. Secondly, if you will, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 5. Luke, chapter 5. Here the disciples had been out on the Sea of Galilee fishing one night. And in the morning, Jesus got into one of the ships and they pushed it out from the shore several yards. And he used that ship as his pulpit and preached to the multitude gathered on the beach. And notice there Luke 5 verses 4 through 6. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Secondly, this will be called the nevertheless of obedience. The nevertheless of obedience. You don't want to do something, but when you agree and go ahead and do it, you, it turns out to be a good decision after all. To be obedient to the Lord, even if you don't understand it, it seems pointless, but you do it anyway, because he asked it of you. He asks it of you. You do whatever your earthly dad and mom and parents tell you to do, because you trust them, and you can't imagine them ever telling you to do something that would result in your harm, your injury. You love them, you know they love you, and you trust them. You and I should be able to trust our Heavenly Father at least that much. At least that much. You know, it was a few years ago, there was a popular atheist, and he would refer to Old Testament Hebrews as Bronze Age Hebrews, who knew nothing about germ theory and microorganisms, and they had strange dietary rules that made no sense uh, to them at the time, and uh, they thought they were worshiping God by the act of circumcision in their bodies and so forth, and what a bunch of primitive people, and didn't know any better. But uh, Jews in the Bible weren't as ignorant as modern man likes to think. They knew a lot more than we give them credit for. First of all, they knew that things reproduced after their own kind, Genesis 1. A heterosexual is going to reproduce another heterosexual. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, 
after their own kind, right? Let me, by the way, let me park there just for a moment. I'm idling in neutral just for a minute. If all things being equal, somebody who, um, a man is interested in a woman, he's attracted to women, he gets married, has a wife and children. Well, all things being equal, let's suppose that somebody was born and they have some genetic desire, some attraction to only people of their own gender. Same sex attraction. They say it's genetic. Well, this man over here only wants to be with his wife or a female. He can never imagine the thought of some other man. Well, all things being equal, that means the person over here only wants to be with someone of their own kind. They can't imagine being with the opposite sex. Follow so far? Everybody follow? Okay. All things being equal, if it's just as genetic as anybody else, then by definition, they don't have children. When that person dies, the gene will die with them. So you can't transmit it from one generation. No, it's not genetically transmitted because by definition, they don't reproduce. So you can't transmit it to your children. They knew that things reproduce after their own kind. They knew that the seed in reproduction came from the father, not from the mother. That was made clear in Genesis 38, the story of Tamar and Judah and the, the sin of Onanism, as it became known. Uh, they knew that the baby would receive whatever the mother ate while still in the womb. Samson's birth, his mother was told not to eat anything that came from a vine or a grape because it would pass to the child. And he was to be a Nazarite from conception, Judges chapter 13. They were told to dig latrines in the camp, to keep the camp clean and sanitary in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23. They were told to incinerate any clothing that was contaminated with leprosy, Leviticus 13. They, the leper was told to cover his face and, and declare himself unclean when someone who was not contaminated came and approached. They're in Leviticus chapter 13. And they were commanded to wash their infected flesh, their filthy flesh, in running water. Leviticus 15, not in a basin of stagnant water where germs could collect. Today, we know the benefits of flushing out a wound in running water, uh, of covering your mouth to avoid airborne contagion, the, the respirator masks. How many people have colds these days and are willing to wear the mask out in public, right? We know uh, the, the sanitary benefits of burying waste product to keep the disease um, from forming. Uh, we know that there are a number of websites that will extol the health benefits of a kosher diet. Yeah. And the World Health Organization still recommends circumcision, especially in third world countries and underdeveloped nations, as a way of, of uh, reducing the spread of communicable diseases. Israel didn't have to understand why God told them to do certain things. All they were supposed to do was obey and do what God told them to do, and the, the health benefits would accrue to them, would come to them nevertheless. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2, Moses said, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. The nevertheless of obedience is a devotion to the Lord to do whatever he commands for no better reason than the fact that he commands it. He wants it. Revelation 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. God doesn't promise that you're going to understand every nuance of the word of God. How many people have, Dr. Ruckman read the Bible from cover to cover just in casual reading, 130, 140 times over the years of his salvation. And he would have been the first one to tell you he doesn't understand all of it. 
I think he understood it better than most men I'll ever meet in my lifetime. However, he'd be the first one to say, you can never exhaust the word of God. It's an eternal book written by an eternal God. But you should read it anyway because he commands you to do so. He wants you to do so. The Bible doesn't promise that the quick and easy prayer of a lazy man will avail much, but it says the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16 You might spend more time praying for an answer to some request than you ever thought you would. But you should anyway because he wants you to. There's been many a saved woman who prayed for years that her unsaved husband would finally turn to God. It seemed like he never would. He never would. He never would. And when, she finally, when he did, finally did get saved, man, she was shouting the glory to God in victory. And um, looking back later, realized it was all worth it. It was all worth it because of a soul. The soul of her own husband. When the disciples obeyed Christ's word to launch out, they got more blessing than they could have imagined. They so much fish, their nets broke on them. Sometimes when you obey God and do what you ought to do, you get a bigger blessing than you ever thought you would. And you kick yourself, if your leg would go up like that, and kick yourself in the backside. How could I have been putting it off for so long? I haven't been reading my Bible. Once I start reading it, something else jumps out at me. You could have jumped out at me six months ago. The nevertheless of obedience follows the word of the Lord because he commands it for no better reason. All right, thirdly, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul had to praise and commend the church of Corinth after he learned of their genuine change for God following his first letter to them. They had some guy who was shacked up with his mother and mother-in-law. And uh, he said, you kick that guy out, turn him over to Satan to for the destruction of his flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. Well, apparently the guy did get right. And in the second letter, he tells him to receive him back into fellowship once again. But uh, so many of the problems of, of conduct and order and discipline he addressed in his first letter, but they had now corrected and were a model of obedience to the preaching and to the revelation of, of God's man. And this was the highlight of, of Paul's travels and all the problems that he had been dealing with. Here in 2 Corinthians 7, begin there at verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless... God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforteth us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. I shouted glory to God, hallelujah, at the table when I was writing this letter. Now, he didn't say that, but... It he wasn't joyful just because he saw his disciple Titus, but because of the news Titus brought to him about how the Corinthians had taken his first letter and his admonition to heart, and they had changed their conduct. They had dealt with this guy who was committing a gross sin to, as a disgrace to the rest of the body. And this is what I'm going to call the nevertheless of revelation. The nevertheless of revelation. When you see the work of God and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in somebody who has turned to him, it's a real revelation to you that there's something to Jesus Christ. Yeah. There's really something to the Savior. There's something to being born again and forgiven of your sins. I can't see it. I can't prove it. But I can't deny it either. Amen. He, can cha he can change. He can transform a man or a woman like no other influence, no other effect in this life can. Uh, we had a young man came to our church. He was in high school. He was a friend of a, one of our young men many years ago. And uh, he came one Wednesday night. He and another guy. And after the service, uh, my dad was preaching those days. Uh, but after the service, I went around here in the side room. And I talked to these two guys. 
and uh, they both prayed to receive Christ as their Savior. One, I think, was just playing games. He went off. I never heard from him again. But the, but the main one, he began coming regularly. And uh, just two or three nights later, he asked me if I could come to his house and meet his mother. His mom was a single mom. And I went to his house and met her. Of course, she wasn't saved. And uh, I described that household to you. He played the electric guitar. And down the hallway in his bedroom, he showed me the giant amplifiers he had in his bedroom. Just across from out of his door, across was the other bedroom door where his brother had his room. And he played the drums. And so both of these guys have their own music going on. Of course, they... The louder one gets, the louder the other one has to crank his own music up, so they're competing to see how loud they can get it. Out in the living room, Mom was trying to watch television, and she had to turn the volume up really loud to keep the noise, to, to hear over her son's music. And they had about four or five house cats. <laughs> and those cats, those cats were on nerves, they had nerves, <laughs> they were on edge. I mean... You didn't try to get close and pet one because they, they, they're jittery. They just run off <laughs> away from you. They're scared to be near you. And uh, I thought, man, if God can ever do anything with this guy, it'll be real work of God. Well, the only Bible he had was a big, thick um, Catholic family Bible on the coffee table. We plunked that down on the dining room table and opened it up and Tried to help him get started. Well, two weeks later, two weeks later, he and I went out for coffee one Friday night. And he had, by that time, he had already bought himself his own Bible, King James Bible. And we sat at the table and in, the, in the restaurant, and he had already committed all the books of the Bible to memory in two weeks. And I would refer to a verse, and he was able to turn. He knew how to find it. And that Friday night, it was about, oh, it was probably 8.30 in the evening by this time. He said, let's go down to the Catholic Church. I want to talk to the priest down the course. I had never done that before. It was new for me. So I was, okay. So we, we went down to the Catholic Church, knocked on the door of the rectory, and a priest uh, opened the door and he said, yeah, I'm so-and-so and my friend here. We wonder if we could talk to you about the Bible. And the priest was kind enough to, to let these two young guys in. We sat, and of course, as we're walking in, he hands me his Bible, like, go get them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and like, as this was, this was at least 30 years ago, I, I wasn't accustomed to that yet. That was new for me. So we sat there at this priest's desk in his office for at least an hour and a half talking about Bible, the Bible and bringing up subjects which uh, the priest tried to, he tried to answer in such a way that he wouldn't lose this young man, you know, as one of their members. It would keep him as a member. And, um, but anyway, by the time we left, his eyes were wide open that that guy knows nothing about the word of God. And it was clear uh, that he, he really didn't. And he went on to become a, a very great uh, soul winner. And uh, I, I just the, the quickness which he was gobbling up the scripture and learning the word of God was just a marvel to see, a miraculous thing to see. He began to, to grow very quickly. And this is what I, I thought the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ is that there's something real to it. It can transform a life. It can change somebody's heart and their mind and their conduct and their attitude and their, their speech and their thoughts like no other influence in the world can do. Amen. And I'm going to try to bring this to a close, everybody. The Bible refers to the Gentiles as the heathen, as the uncircumcised. In fact, the Lord Jesus referred to Gentiles as dogs. Matthew 15, verse 26. And now Paul saw the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, changing these Gentiles into true disciples of the Lord God, in such a way that the Jews were not even worshiping God. The same way, with the same fervency that the Gentiles were. And that was a revelation to him. 
And the nevertheless of Revelation shows how powerful God is to change lives. And you can go from sinner to saint that fast. And you begin to grow uh, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord as you study the Word of God and trust the Holy Spirit to lead and direct. When you have your doubts, God can satisfy your doubts. Thank God for the nevertheless experiences in the Bible. It felt like punishment to you at the time. It turned out to be a blessing. It made no sense when you were going through it. Turns out later it made perfect sense. You saw the hand of God in it. Just when someone seemed like a hopeless case, God saved them, began to change them. You realize there's something to Jesus Christ after all. So I want to thank God for those places where he says, nevertheless, you're going one direction. Nevertheless, you can go in another direction. Either a sinner who needs to be saved or a saint who needs to get right.